I'm Joel Klatt, and this is my 2018 preseason top 25. At number 25, I've got Kansas State, the Wildcats. Bill Snyder, the ageless one. I mean, he's rebuilt this program twice. The first time he brought them from the ashes into a top five in the country scenario. He went back into the top five in this second stint with Colin Klein as his quarterback. This is going to be a really good Kansas State team. No one wants to talk about it. And yeah, it's not sexy and it's not flashy, but guess what? They've got a really solid offensive line returning. Maybe one of the better ones in the Big 12 beside Oklahoma. They've got both quarterbacks who both had success last year, Alex Delton and Skylar Thompson back at quarterback. They've got a defense that returns a lot of players. This is going to be a Kansas State team that's going to win nine or 10 games. Whether you like it or not, that's just what they do. The biggest question mark, and this is so interesting when you get to talk to Coach Snyder, all he wants to talk about, not all the returning players, not his young assistant coach, Colin Klein, who played for him, who's now the co-offensive coordinator. No, no, no. He wants to talk about the special teams and how they have to replace both kickers, the long snapper, and both returner for the first time in his tenure at Kansas State. Gotta love Bill Snyder. At 24, I've got FAU. Yeah, buddy, Lane Kiffin. Gotta love Lane Kiffin. The only person that's had a better renaissance after kind of a fall from grace is Alex Rodriguez. He wins 11 games at FAU. He's one of the best Twitter follows ever created. And all of a sudden we're forgetting about what happened at Tennessee and then USC and with the Raiders and then at Alabama and the leaving early from the playoffs and blah, blah, blah. And now it's all great. And you know what? Lane has embraced it and he's done an excellent job. Again, 11 wins at FAU. They had won three games in three consecutive seasons over the previous three before he got there. They did that in large part because they had one of the best running backs in the country, Devin Singletary. He got 301 carries and scored over 30 touchdowns. Do you know how I know Lane Kiffin has grown as a coach? He gave a running back 301 carries. He goes and learns under Saban. He learns that you gotta pound the rock. He goes to FAU and he gives Singletary 301 carries and he scores over 30 touchdowns. He was an All-American. That's growth from the coaching standpoint. And I think he understands that if he is to get a power five job again, he's gonna have to continue to show that style of growth. As far as the schedule goes, FAU has a couple of really interesting games, one that I'll be at. Gus and I are gonna call FAU at Oklahoma week one of the season. FAU could upset Oklahoma, I'm just saying. That's a team that is very good and Kiffin's gonna have them believing that they can do it. Also in the non-conference, they face Central Florida. So at UCF, uh, at Oklahoma, some interesting non-conference games for them. At number 23, I've got the Utah Utes. Kyle Winningham has been incredibly consistent, and with that South division in the Pac-12 being so open, this could be the year that Kyle Whittingham and the Utes actually win the division and play for the Pac-12 championship. They have their quarterback back in Tyler Huntley. They've got their running back back in Zach Moss. Their defense is always tough. Whittingham is the third most tenured coach at his school in all of college football behind Kirk Ferentz and Gary Patterson. They retained their entire staff and added a former staff member when the Oregon State head coach, Gary Anderson, from a few years ago, now becomes their 10th assistant. So there's a lot of positives right now for Utah, in particular to the fact that when you look around the Pac-12, there's been so much coaching change and so much quarterback change in the last couple of years. When you've got your coach in place, your coordinators in place, and your quarterback in place, it's usually gonna be a recipe for success. The hard part for Utah is their schedule is brutal. Their cross division foes are Washington, Oregon, and Stanford. All right, so the three best teams out of the North. Great, we'll take them. Now, Utah's very good at home. They generally don't shy away from tough competition, but that's a tough schedule. At 22, I've got the Florida Gators. 
Dan Mullen is a great fit for Florida. He was there as a coordinator under Urban Meyer from 05 to 08. He understands the culture and he understands the blueprint that you have to put out there to win there. You see, it's interesting, when you go to these schools, you have to play a certain way to appease the fan base. And at Florida, you gotta score points. They sat through Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow. So even though Jim McElwain won the division twice, he never averaged over 25 points a game. So guess what? Will Muschamp, Jim McElwain, we don't like your defensive-oriented football. We want good quarterback play. We want offense. We want points. Enter Dan Mullen to fix that issue in Gainesville. The first thing Mullen has to do is find a quarterback. Probably going to be Felipe Franks, but they are unsettled to that position. And it's probably going to be something that bleeds into year two and maybe year three before Dan Mullen can get his guy. He has been a quarterback whisperer throughout his career. Think about all the guys he's had from Tebow to Dak Prescott to Nick Fitzgerald. He's done a great job with everybody that he's had under center and he'll find somebody. Will it be this year? I know the Gator fans hope so, but we'll see. The schedule is light for Florida and that's the reason I have them in the top 25. If they had a more difficult slate, in particular in the SEC, I would easily have them outside of the top 25. But they have only four true road games. The only real tough one is at Mississippi State, which should be interesting as Dan Mullen goes back to the place that he was just at. At 21, it's my best group of five team in the country, and it's the Boise State Broncos. Brian Harson has done a great job. I mean, he's been a coach now for four years at Boise State. They've won 42 games and two conference championships. I mean, he's getting it done up there. They've got an experienced quarterback in Brett Rippon who's going to pass the 10,000-yard mark in passing, and if he cuts down on some mistakes, in particular in crucial situations, this is a team that likely is going to enter that New Year's Six conversation as the best group of five team in the country. Their defense should be dominant, and you're probably asking yourself, well, how can they be dominant when they lost one of the best players to the draft coming out of college football and linebacker Leighton Vander Esch? Well, it's because he was literally the only player that they're losing. So even with his 100-plus tackles leaving to the NFL, they retain about 80% of their defensive production on the stat sheet. That's incredible. Boise State's going to be right there in the Mountain West. They're likely going to win that conference crown, and Brian Harson's likely going to find himself in a big New Year's Six game. A quick schedule note for Boise State. They've beaten a Power 5 team in three straight years. They've beaten Washington, Washington State, and Oregon. They travel to Stillwater, Oklahoma in September this year to face Oklahoma State. The year after Oklahoma State loses everybody. Mason Rudolph, James Washington. That's a really good game for Boise State and a game that I know in Big 12 circles, people are very concerned about. At number 20, it's the Oregon Ducks. Mario Cristobal gets promoted from within, and the team loved it. But it wasn't Cristobal that I was most excited about. He's a good coach, very good coach. But it was their defensive coordinator. Retaining Jim Levitt was the biggest thing that Oregon did all offseason. He is a tremendous defensive coach. He improved them last year 12 points per game and 150 yards per game. I expect that to get even better this year. And when you look at their quarterback situation, it may be one of the best in all of college football. They've got a guy that I think could be the top NFL prospect going into next year's draft in Justin Herbert. Now, Justin Herbert is a specimen. He's 6'5", 6'6". He's got a big arm. He runs the offense very well. He's a good decision maker. He's accurate. And guess what? When he was on the field, Oregon averaged 52 points per game. When he wasn't on the field, 15 points per game. That was the nature of their season last year. And now this year with him healthy, I think they can compete for the Pac-12 North and their schedule helps them out. Check this out. Washington is a clear favorite right now in that division. Washington has to travel to Oregon on the second of a back-to-back -back road trip while Oregon is off a bye. That is a huge break from the conference in terms of scheduling. They also host Stanford. So if you're looking at a schedule and a team that could be under the radar, that could win the Pac-12 North, it is clearly the Oregon Ducks.
At number 19, I've got West Virginia. The Mountaineers with Dana Holgerson. And Holgerson's done a really solid job. Not many people give him the credit he probably deserves, but he deserves a lot for what he has done uh, at West Virginia. Now in his eighth season, and he retains both his offensive coordinator, Jake Spavadol, and his defensive coordinator, Tony Gibson. So they've got some good continuity going on their coaching staff. On the field, they have a legitimate Heisman contender in their quarterback, Will Greer. Will Greer could put up Mason Rudolph style numbers. It's the same offense, remember, because Holgerson comes from that Oklahoma State, Mike Gundy type of tree, Mike Leach type of tree, and they've got great wide receivers at West Virginia. Might be really, as far as the tandem, the two best in the country, and David Sills and Gary Jennings. So that offense could be potent for the Mountaineers. As far as their schedule goes, I think it's really easy to get West Virginia to 8 0. They're going to be favored in their first eight games. They face Tennessee in the first week. They have to travel to North Carolina State, which is going to be tough because Dave Dorison's done a nice job with the Wolfpack. But I think West Virginia is in a better spot roster-wise than what North Carolina State is right now. If they beat those two teams, Tennessee and North Carolina State, they will likely go to Austin, Texas, November 3rd, 8-0. They'll probably be in the top five in the country and Will Greer will be the favorite to win the Heisman Trophy at that point. And then it's the gauntlet because they've got Texas, they've got Oklahoma, they've got Oklahoma State and TCU all in November. At number 18, I've got the TCU Horn Frogs. Gary Patterson is the second most tenured coach at his current school in all of college football behind Kirk Ferentz. This guy has done it all at TCU. He was a coordinator, he's been a head coach, and he's been successful doing both. Think about what he's done just in the Big 12 era. Three of the last four seasons, they've had 11 wins or more. And yet, no one talks about them being one of the more preeminent programs in the country. And that's what they do. They just win football games. I know that they're losing a lot of players, but Gary Patterson constantly overperforms with young players, in particular on defense. They've graduated 35 seniors from last year's 11-win team, and yet, they probably have more talent than they have in the past because of the recruiting that they've been doing the last couple of years. Young quarterback, dual threat star Sean Robinson should be on the field for the Horned Frogs. I love what he can do. He's a little bit bigger version of Kenny Hill. He's probably a little bit more athletic and a lot more of what Sonny Cumbie would probably like to do as an offensive coordinator. Defensively, they've got the best player in the Big 12 on the defensive side, Ben Banigou. This guy is a defensive lineman, is dominant. Uh, he's certainly a guy that can get to the quarterback, and Gary Patterson's gonna need that in that attacking style of defense. As far as the schedule goes for TCU early in the season, it's a nightmare. They're going to host Ohio State in a neutral site in Arlington, Texas, and then the very next week, they've gotta play at Texas. That's a brutal stretch in September. If they can get through that, they've got legitimate Big 12 title hopes. At number 17, it's the USC Trojans. Now, Clay Helton, in his first two years as the Trojans head coach, he's gone 21 and six, he won a Rose Bowl, and he won a Pac-12 championship. And you'd think that he was eight and five each year by the way that fan base talks about him. He deserves more, that coaching staff deserves more, and they might be able to earn it this season. The biggest question that they're facing is they've got to replace Sam Darnold. It's not going to be easy, so that's going to be an insanely tough position to fill in for. Now, doing that is likely going to be a true freshman named JT Daniels. Here's why JT Daniels is so interesting. He reclassified from the class of 2019 to the 2018 class, and now he's at USC competing for the starting job. Technically, this fall, he's supposed to be playing quarterback for modern day high school. Now you might be thinking, well, maybe ease him in, maybe don't start him early. But if he's gonna be your quarterback, you might as well get him acclimated early because week two is a road trip to Stanford and week three is a road trip to Texas. I would much rather have a quarterback that has at least seen the fire before I throw him in that fire on the road at Stanford and at Texas. So I expect JT Daniels to be out there. For Trojan fans, you better hope your run game 
is fixed with that offensive line, even minus Ronald Jones, and you better hope that defense is as good as advertised with guys like Cameron Smith at linebacker. At number 16, I've got the Auburn Tigers. I can't remember as wild of a swing in how a fan base felt about a coach as what happened last year with Auburn. Y'all had fired Gus Malzahn and run him out of town, essentially, when they blew the 20-point lead to LSU early in the season. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the season, he signs a seven-year, $49 million contract and everyone's cheering about it. Fascinating. I mean, that's the ebbs and flows, I guess, of being the Auburn head coach. So you've got Malzahn, you've got your guy, and it's a guy who in the previous three seasons was 11 and 13 in SEC play before he beat basically Bama and Georgia in those home games last year. Now, because of that, think of what they've got to do this year. Talking about the schedule, Auburn's schedule is incredibly difficult. I'll put it to you this way. Right now, I've got Washington, Georgia, and Bama all in my top five in the preseason, and Auburn has to play all three of those teams away from home. What's a plus side for Auburn is that on the field, you've got Jared Stidham. I think Stidham's one of the better quarterbacks in the entire country, but he's gonna have to replace a backfield that was highly productive and really was the backbone of the team last year. Carryon Johnson and Cameron Petaway are gone. Now you're going to have to fill that in. Maybe Cam Martin is the most likely to succeed those two and become the next great Auburn running back. But I think it is a pretty clear step back from what Auburn was a year ago. I don't expect them to have the upset wins like they did a year ago. I don't expect them to win the division like they did a year ago. At number 15, I've got Florida State. Now, Florida State, that fan base, they are desperate for success with Willie Taggart, partly because they feel so burned by Jimbo Fisher. He was the first coach in 40 years to win a national championship with a school and then leave for a head coaching job See within later, college football. Uh, it's unprecedented, and that's why that fan base wants Willie Taggart to succeed. You almost they're like rooting for him constantly, not just as a coach, but almost as a person because of how they feel about Jimbo Fisher. It's gonna be difficult for Willie Taggart. That roster is not quite where it was a few years ago when they competed for a national championship, but it is very talented. On the field, you've got DeAndre Francois who's trying to come back from an injury. He should be in a competition with James Blackman. What's going to help either of those guys is that they've got a quality running back tandem. Cam Akers, the tremendous young running back, ran for over 1,000 yards last year, as well as Jacquez Patrick. They, as a tandem, ran for about 1,700 yards. They should lean on that with those quarterbacks. And with the new defensive coordinator, Harlan Barnett, he comes from Michigan State, down to be on Willie Taggart's staff, and it should be an interesting fit there in Tallahassee for a place that has always played great defense and their fans expect it. As far as the schedule, Florida State's schedule is really tough. They have the opener against Virginia Tech. They have to play at Syracuse, and Clemson will tell you that's not as easy as it sounds to go up to the Carrier Dome. They play at Miami, they play at North Carolina State, and they've got Florida and Clemson at home. It's a schedule that won't be easily navigated, in particular for a first year coach. I could see Florida State stubbing their toe a couple of times and ending up with nine wins. And people in Tallahassee are not gonna like just nine wins. At number 14, I'm gonna draw the ire of the Twitterverse because I've got the Texas Longhorns. I think Texas is really good. I think they're a top 15 team. I think they can compete for the Big 12 championship and I think they can do it this year. That coaching staff is one of the best around. I love what Tom Herman has done. The energy and effort with which his players play with uh, is palpable. You can see it. It was different last year, in particular on the defensive side, and that's where I'll start. He retained Todd Orlando, the defensive coordinator. That was a huge deal for Texas. They had to pay him a lot of money, and I understand that, 
but getting him to stay there and have some continuity for some of those defensive players, and in particular some of those younger defensive players, was a huge deal. Tim Beck is still the offensive coordinator. For the 10th assistant, they did something interesting that only the real true blue bloods can do. When you've got the bank account that Texas has, guess what you can do? You can go to a preeminent program, one of the better programs in the country, and you can steal away a bona fide assistant coach for your 10th assistant. That's exactly what Texas did with Herb Hand. He was the offensive line coach for Auburn, and they stole him away and brought him down to Austin, Texas. That's a big get. So a coaching staff that is very deep and one of the best in America. As far as on the field for Texas, it really begins and ends with their quarterbacks. It was a revolving door last year between Sam Ellinger as well as Shane Bouchelle, in large part due to injury. But one thing that either of those guys have to do, or both of them have to do, is they've got to play more consistently. Now, I happen to think Texas is better when Sam Ellinger is on the field. I saw it firsthand last year in a game against USC and several other games in which he infused the, the energy and the spark to that offense. He was also their leading rusher, but he's got to avoid the big mistakes. Texas' schedule is front-loaded. Let's just put it this way. They travel to Maryland to kick things off, then they host USC. They face TCU, Oklahoma, and Kansas State all before Halloween. Needless to say, we're going to know a lot about the Texas Longhorns as we enter November. At number 13, I've got Penn State. The Nittany Lions, James Franklin has done a tremendous job. Now this year, They've got a lot of talent, but let's just go through some of the people that they've lost off of their roster and off of the sideline. Joe Moorhead was their offensive coordinator last year, and he moves on. Now he's the head coach at Mississippi State. And this was a guy who coincided directly with the rise of James Franklin at Penn State. You know, before Joe Moorhead got to uh, State College, James Franklin was suffering through kind of a 500 tenure. And then all of a sudden, Joe Moorhead gets there, Saquon Barkley gets there, and they exploded. Uh, they immediately win a Big Ten championship. They compete at the highest levels. Last year, they obviously were a breath away from bring, being right there as a division winner and a potential Big Ten winner. But now Joe Moorhead is gone. His offensive ingenuity, his game planning, and his play calling move on with it. Now we get to the losses on the field. On the offensive side alone, Trace McSorley, who is a Heisman contender and one of the best quarterbacks in college football, is going to have to negotiate the loss of the most dynamic player in the sport, Saquon Barkley, one of the best tight ends in the sport, Mike Gesicki, and a terrific slot receiver who was a big third down contributor for Trace McSorley and Deshaun Hamilton, along with the play caller. That's a lot to make up for as a quarterback, so a lot of pressure on Trace McSorley. On the defensive side, it's much of the same. Both Cothrans at the defensive tackle position, they've moved on. Jason Cabinda, great leader, great player at the middle linebacker spot, he's moved on. Marcus Allen, the safety, the captain, the team leader, he's moved on. So the middle of the defense has a gaping hole and there's going to be some uh, inexperienced players in those spots. James Franklin has recruited so well. They were number fifth last year in the recruiting rankings. They got the number one linebacker in the country in Micah Parsons, but that is a lot to make up for when you're talking about all that production and all that leadership, what helps Penn State is that they have the most favorable schedule of any of the East contenders. You look at games against Ohio State, Michigan State, Iowa, and Wisconsin all at home. That bodes well. You know why? Trace McSorley is 14-0 at home as a starting quarterback. So maybe they got a chance. At number 12, it's Stanford. David Shaw and the Stanford Cardinal, they have become a staple in the top 15 in the country. And they might rise a little higher than this 12 mark because they've got the potential to do that. Now, David Shaw is one of the best coaches in America. I don't think he gets the love that he probably should because he hasn't won a national championship, but he certainly is one of those guys within the coaching circles that everyone points at and says, He's one of the best to do it. Wouldn't shock me at all if in four or five years we see David Shaw at the NFL level, although right now, while his kids are still under his roof, 
he's really happy at Stanford. On the field, it's always nice to return the most dynamic offensive player in the sport, and that's what they have in Bryce Love. Bryce Love is the human highlight reel. Now, he's not quite Saquon Barkley, but he was more explosive, in particular running the football. Did you know he had 25 carries of 30 or more yards? That's insane. You know how I know that? There were only two teams that had more. Teams. He's sensational. I think he's going to be right in the thick of the Heisman Trophy race, and in large part due to the fact that he's going to have some better quarterback play from the get-go. KJ Costello is a really good player. He's got a solid wide receiver core and a solid tight end core, along with a pretty good offensive line. I think this is going to be a much better Stanford offense, more balanced Stanford offense than we saw a year ago. The question marks for me are on the defensive side because it was a defense that underperformed last year at times, namely against Sam Darnold week two when Darnold just torched him. And they lose their best defensive player. Harrison Phillips at a defensive tackle position made like a million tackles. Literally, he had a hundred tackles from the defensive tackle position. Incredible production. So losing him, they have no one else on the roster that can fulfill that production. So it's going to have to be by committee for that defense. And they're going to have to get much better and play much more consistent if they want to challenge for that North Division crown, ultimately overtake Washington and win the Pac-12 championship. As far as the schedule goes, it's pretty difficult for the Stanford Cardinal. They've got to go to Oregon and go to Washington. Very difficult to do. Plus, they've got to travel to Notre Dame. So it's not going to be easy for Stanford, but they've got the pieces to potentially win the Pac-12 and fight for a playoff spot. At number 11, it's the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Now, Brian Kelly's in his ninth year. But you think to yourself, wow, it's already been nine years. Did you know that only four coaches in Notre Dame history have been there longer than Brian Kelly? All four of those coaches won a national championship at Notre Dame. Brian Kelly played for a national championship, but he has yet to get up into that echelon where he's competing with the likes of Alabama and Clemson and Georgia and Ohio State. This year, probably not the year that they do that. They're a very good team, but they've got to recoup a lot of holes in particular on that offensive line. It won't be easy to replace Mike McGlinchey and Quentin Nelson off the offensive line, but remember it is year nine, so after all that recruiting, you should have talent to plug and play. A uh, big question for me about Notre Dame is the play of their quarterback, Brandon Wimbush. At times he was brilliant last year, and then at times he looked a bit lost. So consistency is the name of the game for Wimbush. The schedule is difficult. Notre Dame plays one of the more difficult schedules in the entire country. So you've got Michigan, Stanford, Virginia Tech, Florida State, USC. It starts to look like, hey, 10 wins would be a great season probably looking more like nine or eight wins in South Bend. At number 10, it's the U, Miami. I don't have my turnover chain just yet, but that's all right. We're going to get a turnover chain. I'll be wearing it most of the season because I think that the U is going to be right there. In his first two seasons, Mark Rick won nine games and then 10 games, and there's a good chance that they're going to even bump up from that. There's a good chance that Miami gets to 11 wins because when you look at their schedule, it's favorable. They get LSU early. That's a good time to get LSU because I don't think LSU is going to be that great of a football team. They have to travel to Virginia Tech late. We'll see what Virginia Tech is. I love what Justin Fuente has done with the Hokies, but I don't think they're as talented as Miami. And really, the only other tough, tough game is Florida State, but they get Florida State at home. And I've been one to criticize the home atmosphere at Miami. Ever since they left the old Orange Bowl, it just hasn't been the same until last year. Listen, we were all watching when the Fighting Irish went down there, and it was a top-ten matchup. That place was 
berserk. And it was phenomenal to see that atmosphere for Miami and for all of college football to see the U kind of back in that stage. Maybe not back in terms of competing for the national championship, but certainly back on the uh, preeminent stage of, of college football. This team certainly has the ability to win 11 games. All of that rides for me on Malik Rozier the quarterback. Late in the season, he was not good, and he's got to improve his consistency. The way he played at Pitt and then so on and so forth through the back uh, end of that season was just not good enough. Mark Rick knows that. I think Mark Rick is the type of coach, in particular with his background on the offensive side, that can help foster the environment of making better decisions, in particular in crunch time situations for the quarterback. They've got all their running backs back. This is a, a solid team with Shaq Quarterman at the middle linebacker spot. They're talented enough where Malik Rozier doesn't have to be fantastic in order for them to win, in particular with that schedule. Mark Richt has done a heck of a job, and I think Miami will certainly be there in the ACC. I think they win the division and face Clemson in the ACC title game. At number nine, I've got Michigan State. Mark D'Antonio is as consistent as they come in college football. And after uh, the season he had two years ago, there were a lot of questions about what this program was going to be. They came off of that playoff berth. They got trounced by Alabama. There was a lot of wringing of hands, if you will, around Michigan State. The bottom line was they went out there with a pretty inexperienced team and won 10 football games. It's a heck of a job from Mark D'Antonio. Off of the 10-win team, they bring 19 starters back. 19. That's incredible. Everybody is back. Brian Lewerke, the quarterback. LJ Scott, the running back. All the production on the defensive side, outside of Chris Fry, the middle linebacker, they bring back. This is a very good team, and it might not be pretty all the time, but the bottom line is they're going to win, and they're going to win a lot. The schedule actually works out more in their favor than you would expect. It's an early season game that's very interesting. They travel to Arizona State, which will be hot, but they should beat the Sun Devils. They travel to Penn State when Penn State is coming off a bye, which is not great, but they get to host Ohio State and they host Michigan. So two very important games they get in their backyard and it's tough to play there. Just ask Penn State. That season for Saquon Barkley basically died in the rain in East Lansing last season. At number eight, I have the Michigan Wolverines. And before you roll your you eyes and believe everything really? that some other network shoves down really? your throat about Jim Harbaugh and his failures at Michigan, let me just point out that before he got there, they were abysmal. They were a five-win program, and when he got there, people were thinking, hey, will we be in the top 10 within three years? He got them in the top 10 by that November. He's a great football coach. One of the best in America. The defense is gonna be incredible this year. One of the best defenses in the country, certainly in the top three or four in the country, led by Rashawn Gary, Khalid Hudson, Chase Winovich. They're gonna be able to attack the quarterback as good as anybody out there, in particular because of their creative and attacking style defensive coordinator, Don Brown. Now they do have some changeover on the offensive side of the staff. Jim McElwain, the former Florida head coach, is now with the Michigan Wolverines on the offensive side. They still have Pep Hamilton and they lose Tim Drevno. Tim Drevno was the offensive coordinator in name. He moves to USC as a position coach for Clay Helton in Southern California. On the field, Michigan for two straight, maybe even three straight seasons has been a quality quarterback away from playing in the playoff, if not for a Big Ten championship. And this year, they're gonna have the most talented quarterback that Jim Harbaugh has had in college since Andrew Luck. Shea Patterson, now eligible from the NCAA. He'll be your quarterback in Michigan. They've got a great stable of running backs. The young wide receivers, which underperformed last year, mainly due to quarterback play, should be much better this year. I think Michigan is a real sleeper. People talking about Jim Harbaugh's failures, get ready, because this could be a playoff team. They're gonna start for me at number eight.
at number seven, maybe against my own wisdom, I've got Oklahoma. I think they can replace Baker Mayfield. It's going to be tough, but this team, program, head coach, and quarterback that will be on the field is just unique enough that I feel like they can have a quality season, potentially a Big 12 championship season, even a year removed from having the most impactful and uh, productive player in college football. Mayfield was sensational. You look at what he did in one possession games late. You look at what he did from a production standpoint in big games against ranked foes on the road. I mean, any category, Baker Mayfield was incredible. Oklahoma fans, just know that it's not always gonna be pretty. There's gonna be some growing pains. There might even be a stumbling block, hopefully not two, in your season here with Kyler Murray, and that's what we'll start. Kyler Murray is the quarterback. On the field, it will look different. With Kyler Murray in the backfield, Rodney Anderson in the backfield, Trey Sermon in the backfield, what you have is potentially the best rushing team outside of Navy, Army, and Air Force in the country. I think Oklahoma could have that type of success running the football behind the Big 12's best offensive line and with those three guys in the backfield running the ball, including Kyler Murray. What will that also help? The defense, because Lord knows they need a lot of help. That defense gave up 200 yards rushing or more five times last year. Five! As far as the coaching staff goes, Lincoln Riley's the best offensive mind in America right now. I think this guy, if he wasn't at a blue chip program already, he would be up for every single job in America. Uh, he might start getting overtures from the NFL because the NFL has started moving to the college game of schematics. There were over 25 NFL programs, uh, organizations, that came to Oklahoma this offseason, and it wasn't just to study Baker Mayfield. There was a lot of that. Guess what they came to do? Talk with Lincoln Riley about what he does offensively. He's one of the best play callers in college football, and that will help Kyler Murray as he navigates here this season after Baker Mayfield. As far as the schedule goes, it's the same old for Oklahoma. It begins and ends really with that Red River game. If they can beat Texas, then they've got a great chance to move ahead on that schedule and then ultimately face some tough teams late in their season. A huge game for them is they've got to travel to Morgantown, West Virginia the last week of the season and face what I think is going to be a very good West Virginia team. So watch out for that. Uh, Oklahoma, you might want to sew up that Big 12 title berth before you play in Morgantown that last week of the season. At number six, it's the Washington Huskies. This is a very good Husky team. Listen, when you got an incumbent quarterback like Jake Browning, you're going to have a chance. And do I think he's going to play more like the Jake Browning of two years ago rather than the Jake Browning of last year? Yeah, probably. And his accuracy went way up last year. He threw for nearly 68%. Like Jake Browning, I think he's going to take the next step. As far as other points of their roster, Miles Gaskin is going to become the Washington all-time leading rusher this year, barring any injury. I think he's going to have a really big year behind a very good offensive line. Obviously, Chris Peterson, going back to his Boise days, has a blueprint, and he knows how to be successful. He knows how to win. And he has done that at Washington with a playoff berth two years ago. As far as the schedule goes, it's really tough. Washington has the most important non-conference game of anybody in the entire country. Not only for them, because clearly it's important to their program, but for their entire conference. They play Auburn week one of the season, and Auburn is a pretty clear third position in the SEC, and Washington is right now a pretty clear favorite in the Pac-12. You cannot have your conference favorite lose to a third place team out of the SEC. Washington has to win that game. I don't believe that Washington can go to the playoff if they lose that game, even if they run the table the rest of the way. Remember, this 13-person committee is incredibly subjective. Look at what they did last year. They will reward the teams out of the SEC whether they earned it or not. So Washington has to win against Auburn. They could stumble elsewhere in their schedule, but beat Auburn, and that game will carry them to a potential playoff berth. That's how important it is. Bryce Love for Stanford, his Heisman chances might rest on Auburn, Washington in week one. Because if Washington loses that game, who's watching Pac-12 football outside of the entertainment value? No one's thinking to themselves, 
We got playoff contenders in the Pac-12. We've got Heisman contenders in the Pac-12. Unless the Huskies beat the Tigers. That game cannot be overstated. My number five team going into the season is the Wisconsin Badgers. This could be the best Wisconsin team that we've seen in the modern era for Wisconsin. We've seen some good ones. We've seen a Heisman Trophy winner, several Rose Bowl winning teams, Big Ten championship teams. But there seems to be something different about this Wisconsin team. And namely, you've got the best offensive line in America returning with the star running back and the incumbent quarterback. The offense could be prolific. Alex Hornibrook was really maligned much of last season for the mistakes and the miscues. But late in the season, he turned that around. I know people will point at the two interceptions he threw in the Big Ten Championship game, but he played much better than that. He was also the deciding factor against Michigan, in which they really blew Michigan out at home late in November. Hornibrook is a good player. He got much better, and his wide receiver core is one year older, more talented, and has that much more experience. I think that this offense could be special. Jonathan Taylor will be in the Heisman Trophy race. He was third in the country in yards per game last year rushing the football. And behind that offensive line, Wisconsin could be in that 30, 35, 40 points per game territory. I love what Wisconsin's staff is. Paul Chris is who he is. He's soft-spoken. He's a wonderful coach of the sport and teacher of the sport. And he's got a defensive coordinator that is candidly one of my favorite out there, Jim Leonard. He's a young guy who's going to be a head coach at some point, maybe some point soon. But this is a guy that has taken a defense that was playing at a very high level. And he put his stamp on that defense, his fingerprint on that defense. And they've gotten even better because of everything that they give from an eye candy perspective to the opposing quarterback. They've got great players on that defense, led by TJ Edwards, one of the best linebackers in the country. Wisconsin is easily the favorite to win the West Division, and then it becomes, can you beat the teams in the East? And when it comes to the schedule, that's what it's all about, beating the teams out of the East Division. Paul Christ is two and four against the top tier East Division teams, Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, and Ohio State. And the bottom line is, in a season in which it's really conference championship or bust, playoff berth or bust, that's the marker. They have got to not only get to that championship game, but knock down the door. They lost to Penn State two years ago. They lost to Ohio State last year. They've been right there in very competitive games. It's just on the Badgers to knock down that door with maybe a very powerful run game. At number four, I've got the Georgia Bulldogs. Kirby Smart is and has been building something really special at Georgia. I think Georgia is on the precipice of entering that Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State territory if they haven't already. I know they played for the national title. They were within a breath of winning that national title. And that's really all that keeps them apart from those three programs because all three of those programs have won national championships under their current head coach. Georgia looks like they're headed in that direction. Alabama has been stamped at number one, not only in the country, but on the recruiting trail for really the better part of seven, eight years. Guess what they did last year, speaking of the Bulldogs. Kirby Smart hauled in the best recruiting class in the country. That is a huge deal. Now, as far as those players on the field, it is going to be very difficult this season in particular for Georgia to replace what they had not only in the leadership realm offensively and defensively, but also from a production standpoint. Roquan Smith, gone. He was the Buckus Award winner. The most prolific tandem in FBS history at the running back position, Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb, gone. Similar to Alabama and Clemson. The quarterback situation is interesting, only because of how well they've recruited. You've got Jake Fromm, who cemented himself as a big game player in that win in the Rose Bowl over Oklahoma, and also now you've got Justin Fields. As far as the schedule goes, Georgia's schedule is pretty light. They play at South Carolina and at LSU. Outside of that, it's pretty light. I fully expect Georgia to win the East. They absolutely should. 
and they should be in a rematch of the national championship game in the SEC championship against Alabama. At number three, it's the Ohio State Buckeyes. And at least now we know what's going on with their head coach, Urban Meyer. He's going to be suspended for the first three games. And quite candidly, the only test within those three games is going to be week three in a pseudo road game neutral site in Dallas against TCU, a very good Gary Patterson coach team. Now, regardless of what you think of how Ohio State handled the situation with Urban Meyer, or what you think of Urban Meyer himself. The fact remains, the roster for Ohio State is insanely talented, and that's why they're gonna stay at number three. On the field, replacing JT Barrett is not gonna be all that easy. JT meant so much to Ohio State, both in crucial situation run running the football, as well as his leadership. Now, we did get a glimpse of what the Buckeyes could and maybe should be moving forward. Dwayne Haskins, behind Michigan, in the big house, in the second half, came in and played phenomenal. I think that gives Buckeye fans a lot of hope mo moving forward that not only the style of the play, but also the quality of the player is going to lead Ohio State into kind of this next era of Buckeyes football. You're going to see more down the field passing. You're likely to see more featured running back uh, runs with J.K. Dobbins, which is very similar to the blueprint that they had winning the national championship when it was Cardell Jones and Ezekiel Elliott. The defense is loaded, led by Nick Bosa, who I think is one of the most dominant players in all of college football. As far as the schedule, Ohio State's schedule does them no favors. It's by far the hardest schedule of any of the top five teams. They play 11 Power 5 opponents, including TCU in the state of Texas in a neutral side in Arlington. They play at Michigan State. They play at Penn State. That's a very difficult slate. I know they get Michigan at home, but it's the Big Ten East, it's the best and toughest division by far, and the Buckeyes have no favors in their schedule. At number two, it's the Clemson Tigers. Dabo Sweeney has built what is clearly the second best program in college football. You look at their record, and right now Clemson is sitting at 40 and four in the last three seasons. That's incredible. As far as on the field, I don't think I've ever seen as dominant a position group as Clemson's gonna have on the defensive line this year. Clemson's defensive line could be the best we've ever seen in college football. Four potential first round draft picks. Three almost certainly, that's incredible. The dominance that they're gonna have up front with an experienced defensive coordinator, led by Cleveland Farrell, who's an All-American, this guy's 6'5", could be a top one, two, three draft pick. That defensive line's out of this world. The question marks, probably on the offensive side. You go to the quarterback position. Right now, it's a competition. You've got Kelly Bryant, the incumbent, and you've also got the talented freshman, Trevor Lawrence. Very similar situation to Alabama. You got capable guys that you're gonna have to decide between. The only hard part is you don't want it to fracture the locker room. So if Dabo Sweeney can navigate the quarterback issue, I fully expect Clemson to be right there for the ACC crown and another playoff berth. Their schedule is very good and much tougher than Alabama's. Early, a great road game in true road game fashion at Texas A&M. They also have to travel to Florida State. So those are two tests for Clemson and we know that they stumbled last year on the road at Syracuse, so let's just not write them off as undefeated just yet. My number one team for 2018, it's no surprise here, it's Alabama. Alabama is right now the preeminent program in all of college football. Coming off of a national championship with that roster, I know that there's some holes, but listen, they're gonna be able to fix them. Nick Saban is the best coach in college football right now. He's got, uh, how many, five national titles. He's won 125 games overall at Alabama. It's been a decade of dominance, and everybody else is just catching up. 
on the field for Alabama, it's really all about the quarterback position and the questions surrounding whether it's going to be Jalen Hurts, the guy who's 26-2 and two and led the Tide to two national championship games, including winning one of those, or is it going to be the savior from last year who played one half of football, meaningful football, to attack of Iloa? As far as the schedule goes, this is by far the easiest schedule of any of the top teams in the country. If Alabama is not the SEC champion and not in the playoff, I'm going to be shocked. They're probably not going to play a ranked team, at least inside of the top 15, until maybe the Iron Bowl. That's how bad their schedule is this year. It's one of the worst in the country, and they should steamroll it. Unfortunately, all the pundits will not talk about that, and they're going to give up a nice free pass to Alabama on their schedule. But rest assured, that's one of the worst schedules in the country. Thank <laughs> you.